So, uh, cannulation, it starts with vascular ultrasound. I think that is very evident also at ECMO, as you can see here, periprocedural guidance um, is important. Otherwise, you risk to end up with your venous cannula in the carotid artery, as in this patient in Regensburg in the southern part of Germany, a very experienced center, but still you can up with a lot of trouble. So in veno venous ECMO, the classical cannulation is two sides, so femoral and jugular, so that is quite straightforward. This is in Utrecht, we do that at the bedside with echo, TEE um, mainly, and you see that ECMO uh, cannulation is really centered around uh, optimal echocardiography. That really helps to put uh, the catheters in in a good way. So TEE combined with TTE, uh, inferior cable vein and bicaval view are important. But what you should realize is that you should be very familiar with the material that you use. So this is the multi-stage venous cannula, so the drainage cannula with a uh, couple of holes that you would put in to the inferior cable vein. So this is the obturator, this is the cannula, this is the tip of the um, cannula that gives back the arterialized blood, so it looks different. But then the question comes up, how does such a cannula look under echocardiography? And here you can see, uh, um, I had a discussion in the past with one of my colleagues, a cardiologist, whether we could um, see the pacemaker wires well under TEE, and therefore I took a water bath and put in a TEE tube. And you can see that the, um, the pacemaker wire is actually very well visible under TEE, and that brought me actually to uh, this setup where I took the water bath again, and I put in a guide wire, and that is, of course, trivial. You can see the guide wire. But then it comes to the cannula, together with the obturator. And then you, thi you see this structure, and if you look very carefully, and this is the ideal world of a water bath, you can see that you can also see the holes, but not very well. So you do not exactly know where is now the tip of the cannula. Only if you retract the obturator, then the image really inverts, and you can see that the holes are still there, but it looks different. So this is the picture that you see if you have done the procedure. So this was the guide wire. But where is the tip? This is the cannula tip with no guide wire. But if, it I if I put the guide wire in, look at this. Where is the tip? I don't know. And the tip is very crucial in the introduction procedure. So guide wire plus cannula tip, um, even more um, yeah, no, um, um, anxious uh, looks uh, really tricky actually, this tip. Uh, so with no guide wire, this is really not a good idea. And this is the problem. You might perforate simply in the inferior cable vein, as you can see here. And you should realize that anatomy is not as it is depicted in the brochures of the industry. It's not a straight line, the SVC, IVC axis. It's not a straight line. So if you cannulate the drainage cannula, from the femoral vein, then you should assure that the guide wire is really up and well in the superior cable vein. You should really look in the bicaval view and see that the guide wire is in a good position. We had a complication where the guide wire was turning in the right atrium, upper right atrium, and was going like this in a loop into and stayed in the atrium, and we just perforated the right atrium, and the patient died. So that's a real big problem that you're facing, and then you cannot do uh, an urgent thoracotomy within five minutes. It's, it's, it's really not trivial. So assure that the guide wire is in the upper uh, part of the superior cable vein. So if it comes to venovenous cannulation and single side cannulation, it's also not trivial. Again, you need echo, TE and TTE, by cable view and inferior cable view. This is what you would like to achieve, but realize it's not a straight line. It's not a straight line. It is angulated. So the superior cable vein comes into the right atrium like this and the inferior cable vein like this. So if you approach 
as has been shown in Rotterdam, without proper echo, then you end up in the right ventricle. And you might even perforate the right coronary artery if, if you leave the cannula in that position. It's not a straight line. So you should be very much aware of your material and the dimensions. So what we do, we use in patients where we can plan the procedure, we would opt for TEE, TTE and fluoroscopy on a hybrid OR. So that's super safe. This is a CF patient going for a lung transplant, so needed a bridge uh, cannula. And what we do first, we put the cannula still in the package on the patient and we use fluoroscopy just to come up with an educated guess. It looks very unprofessional what we do here, but this is in order to see if the dimensions of the patients is okay in order to end up with your cannula in a stable posi position within the inferior cable vein. If you have a patient or one meter 90, you know that you will never end up in a stable position in, in the inferior cable vein. So that is very important to know beforehand. And then you need echo in order to uh, achieve pictures like this and also to know that the cannula is really in a deep position within the inferior cable vein. And here you can see that the dimensions, so you should be aware of the dimensions from the infusion hole to the end of the cannula, you should exactly know how many centimeters that are. So and that is something that you can assess with echo. So we start the procedure with a bicaval view, as you can see here. So guide wire in the bicaval view, um, again here, so superior cable vein, inferior cable vein. This is not good, of course. This is the guide wire which goes into the right ventricle. And that is, of course, the position that you would like to achieve, guide wire um, within the inferior cable vein. So this is a position in a very tall patient. So you do not reach the inferior cable vein, and if you have done the procedure already, then it's not possible to move into the, easily move into the inferior cable vein, you will end up in one of the hepatic veins, since that is the straight line. This is not the, not the, um, not the right axis. So very easy, and you see that this tip is really uh, scratching here on the bottom of the right atrium, and then you end up with this scenario as um, shown by the Rotterdam group. Again here, this is not the good position. This is the hepatic vein. This is not the inferior vein. And wh what you should realize is that the original guide wire, which is um, provided with the introduction set, is very, very floppy. So if you put the guide wire into the inferior cable vein, it will not give you sufficient support in some patients. So if you have the guide wire in the position deep in the inferior cable vein and you come down with a cannula in this way, where the guide wire goes that way, then you can understand that the guide wire will not give you support. The guide wire tends to come out of the inferior cable vein and move directly into the right ventricular cavity. If you do not pay attention with fluoroscopy or with TEE, but you have to be very, very careful since you have to switch then from a transthoracic inferior cable vein view to the bicaval view constantly to, s to, to really monitor the procedure in a proper way. Or you have to use a stiff guide wire, but that is not intended for venous use since you might cut um, the, the vein simply. So this is the position that you would like to achieve with a single... Um, side double lumen cannula. Again, you should be aware of the dimensions. So you can see here that uh, depending on uh, the exact position and the dimension of the cannula, the distance between the infusion port and the tip of the cannula is 9.4 centimeters. And you can assess that simply with, ECMO, with echo. You can see it's perfect. So here's the tricuspid valve. You cannot assess that with fluoroscopy. You do not see where the tricuspid valve is exactly. You can see the diaphragm vaguely, but you cannot exactly see where it is. So fluoroscopy is not optimal to position the cannula in the best way. 
So here's the diaphragm. So if you would like to follow up the patient with chest X-ray in the Avalon dumal lumen cannula, it's not possible since you do not know exactly where the tricuspid valve is and you can, cannot even see exactly the cannula. So it's not trivial, the venovenous uh, cannulation with a single side cannula. This is the way it should look. And you should also be aware that recirculation is also a problem if you put it too deep or if you turn it around, then you might end up with recirculation even in the dual lumen uh, single side cannula. I will speed up a little when we can discuss that when we go to the workshop. Um, the cannula configuration, uh, again, veno venous, two side femoral jugular or femoral femoral, that is also in some patients a very quick and efficient way to cannulate the patient, but recirculation can be a problem, but not necessarily. That depends, of course, also on your abdominal pressure and on the intravascular filling status of the patient, and then again, the single lumen cannula. Some people, uh, provide um, recommendations for the exact distance that you should have between the cannulae. But that depends on many, many factors, of course, on the, on the exact design of the cannula and on uh, intra-abdominal pressure, on the intravascular volume and so forth and so forth. So this is not a golden rule. It's a recommendation and it's something to think about. So adequate distance is important to avoid recirculation, but it's not trivial to assess that, and that might be very dynamic in the same patient, although the cannulas are in the same position. Here you can see that recirculation in the inferior caval vein with a single side dual lumen cannula, if it is um, put a little too deep and turned around, then you can see that the arterial flow is going into the inferior cavel vein, so this will create recirculation. This is uh, quite a good position. You can also assess with a continuous wave Doppler, of course. But you can also see that spontaneous breathing might also contribute to recirculation. If you look very, very carefully to the venous line, then you can see that it, it arterializes. You see this? And this is spontaneous breathing. See this? So. This is just to show you that recirculation is a very, very dynamic thing. You have ultrasound technology to look continuously, more or less continuously to recirculation. We do not do that uh, usually. Um, if you're interested, I can tell you a little more on this. I think this ultrasound delusion technology is complementary to, to ECHO, but it's labor intensive and you have seen that it's a very, very uh, dynamic thing. Realize that the abdominal compartment and the intravascular filling is very important for recirculation. You can see here uh, in a patient where the inferior uh, caval vein is really compressing the cannula in hypovolemia, but if you infuse a little fluid, then you can see that the cannula moves free again. So this is the effect of volume. So you can understand that this is, of course, the for the situation. Briefly, venoarterial cannulation, again, TE and TTE are important. Bifemoral is easy, but in bifemoral, you should realize, and we'll come back to that later, that there is a competition, of course, between the native heart and the arterial blood. And if the heart is not able to develop contractile reserve, then you will end up with this. Um, a closed aortic valve since the native heart is not able to eject blood against the retrograde flow. And then you will end up with a thrombus in the aortic root or in the ventricle. So then you might choose to uh, reduce ECMO flow a little. Otherwise you will end up with this. So really thrombosis of the left ventricle and this creates really a futile situation as is reported in this case. You might think that thrombus in the left ventricle is a contraindication to VA ECMO, but not necessarily. This is a patient with um, um, a persistent myocarditis with thrombi due to uh, bad left ventricular function. So we put in a balloon pump and a VA ECMO. And you can see that you can achieve a good result even if you start with thrombi in the left ventricle. So thrombi in the left ventricle are not a contraindication, and this is 
the cardiac recovery after a few weeks. Um, you can use VA ECMO as a bridge to reflection, just to think about what you would do with a patient. This is a 40 fe for uh, a female, and you might think, well, is this, is this myocardial infarction? She was known with hypertension and hemodialysis. And you can see that this is really uh, very suggestive of a Takotsubo or stress-induced cardiomyopathy, which rarely goes into cardiogenic shock. Normal coronary angiogram. And you can see after three days, she was a very fast responder, so no weaning was even necessary and complete recovery, actually, after six weeks. So ECHO can help you with this in the beginning, but also to decide, well, this could be a bridge to reflection. And also ECHO can help when it comes to follow up. This paper shows you that venous thrombosis might follow venovenous ECMO, but also venoarterial ECMO. So you might consider to prolong anticoagulation and also echo follow up of the venous system in order to avoid deep venous thrombosis. Since this paper shows us that about 20% of ECMO survivors have deep venous thrombosis post cannulation. So echo in ECMO and you is very useful, I think, for the cannulation, periprocedural imaging and guidance, but also for the management. Cannula position check, recirculation, volume status, but also cardiac condition and loading, uh, and veno arterial thromboembolism, but also weaning in cardiopulmonary recovery. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions? Many questions, probably. So um, may I ask, who, who is performing ECMO already? One, two, three, four. OK, so it's really a start for you. OK. Was it clear for everyone? No? OK. So what is important to know is that if you have not a very much experience, but uh, you're going to start, then it's very important to look for um, a very good connection to experienced centers that you may feel a very low threshold to call experienced colleagues in Belgium or in Holland or wherever you, you are, uh, since that helps a lot. You've seen that there are many, many pitfalls and many very small issues that especially if it comes to very complex patients as the bridge to transplant patients that are very, very important to cover in an appropriate way in order to achieve uh, a good result. And that holds for VV, for VA, but also if it comes to resuscitation ECMO, which is very complex, and ECMO and trauma, which I think is it's really a rare indication, but you might be um, facing that in the clinics, that the trauma surgeon comes to you and has um, heard of a congress that that is possible. So he might or she might say, well, by not doing ECMO. So then you should, I think, discuss such a case beforehand or when the patient is on ECMO. So how to, to manage it in the best way. Okay.